Almost 56 million years ago, there was a period of massive and rapid warming worldwide, forcing many plants and animals to adapt quickly. As it happened in a relatively short time span, it's also very helpful to compare it to today, providing us with helpful information as to what happens to the flora and fauna, as well as how quickly the Earth can naturally recover. First, let's set the scene. 56 million years ago, the average temperatures were much higher than they are today, averaging around 17 degrees Celsius warmer. There probably weren't any ice sheets or sea ice by the poles. Then, suddenly, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and by extent, the temperatures, increased. This is the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM for short. It's an event during which the temperature increased by 5 to 10 degrees, and, as the name alludes to, it happened at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, lasting 100 to 200,000 years. So, what caused it? Even today, the causes of the PETM are not completely certain, but recent research does propose new mechanisms. Originally discovered in the late 1980s, the cause was first suggested to be a massive release of deep sea methane hydrates, then causing warming worldwide. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, and methane is also abundant in the deep sea floor. This caused the largest deep sea benthic faunal extinction in the last 90 million years, with Antarctic waters warming by around 5 degrees Celsius. These methane hydrate sources are actually quite stable, but as the ocean temperatures increased, they became less stable and dissociated, triggering a vicious cycle continuously releasing more methane. Based on models proposed in 2001, the warming began at least 2,000 to 4,000 years before the carbon release. They could not, however, confirm nor deny the thermal dissociation of methane hypothesis, so they also consider that the mechanical failure of a continental slope could be the culprit. Due to changing ocean currents, the seabed could have eroded and eventually released methane when it collapsed, thereby triggering the PETM. If this were the case, then this methane release would be the cause, rather than the result, of the rapid temperature increase. This may have later led to more thermal dissociation, starting a cycle. Over the course of the PETM, at least 2,000 gigatons of CO2 were emitted, double the amount that the IPCC suggests we need to remove by 2100. Because the PETM has become more nuanced in recent years, moving on from a singular cause, the methane dissociation hypothesis, to a more varied cause, potentially including mantle outgassing, wildfires, drying epicontinental seas, melting of permafrost, along with the dissociation of methane. The study of the PETM could help to better understand how ecosystems and oceans react to carbon release, a problem we are facing today. During that period, the Earth became more vulnerable and climate sensitive due to the high greenhouse gas levels. This period is also related to the acidification of the ocean and the mass extinction of benthic foraminifera, which lived in the deep sea. Now, what happened to the animals at that time? As you might expect, the dramatic shift in climate led to changes in the evolution of flora and fauna, both on land and in the oceans. During the PETM, carbon, oxygen, and levels of other crucial elements changed. As a result, the characteristics of almost all living things had to adapt in one way or another. One particularly interesting adaptation that occurred is evolutionary dwarfing. This is a phenomenon that was first recognized in 1847 by Carl Bachmann, which states that within a broadly distributed taxonomic clade, populations and species of larger size are found in colder regions, while populations and species of a smaller size are found in warmer regions. While this may seem like a relatively general statement, this rule adheres to 72% of birds and 65% of mammals. The increasing temperatures of the Earth induced such changes in the mammals that were around at the time. There are two proposed mechanisms that account for these changes. The first mechanism is that decreased body size is a result of immigration poleward. As temperatures rose, many mammals migrated poleward in an attempt to escape an increasingly warm habitat. For example, Ecotocean parvus and Tylehardinia branti, herbivorous mammals found in North America, experienced decreased body size as a result of poleward migration. The second mechanism is that reduced body size is an anagenetic response of mammals who already inhabited a given region to environmental changes. The basis of this mechanism is that in many plants, elevated carbon dioxide levels result in increased biomass, but reduced nitrogen and protein content. Plants became less nutritious and harder for herbivores to digest. As a consequence, herbivorous mammals experienced slower growth and less reproductive success. 
In a knock-on effect, carnivorous mammals are also affected by this, as their food is also giving them less nourishment, preventing growth and development. Several examples of this have been found across Europe, Asia, and North America during the PETM. In fact, in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, 40% of mammals underwent a reduction in body size. For example, Dysicus pronuntius, a now extinct carnivorous mammal, and Cyphrippus sandrae, a herbivorous PETM taxa, had 30% reduction in body weight. On top of this, it was also discovered that there was a 76% recovery rate following the PETM, where decreasing temperatures after this climate change event led to an increase in body size. As stated before, the PETM lasted anywhere from 100 to 200,000 years. But why did it last so long? This was researched by studying the heat conduction in marine sediments. Initially, we thought the methane hydrates were associated within around 10,000 years, but it turns out it may have been closer to 50,000. This long tail of methane hydrate dissociation was, however, a more gradual release of carbon, potentially explaining the longevity of the PETM. The PETM is often used as a historical analog to the Holocene, providing a possible reference to how our pollution and emissions of CO2 today could play out in the future. Many have questioned if the dissociation of methane hydrates could pose a problem for us as a major carbon emitter, but it seems that this is unlikely. Due to the average temperature being much colder today, and the release of methane hydrates being a function of temperature and pressure, it could be a potential source of carbon emissions down the road, but probably not as extreme as during the PETM. The PETM is fairly new and still leaves many unanswered questions. The climate is getting warmer worldwide, causing plants and animals to adapt once more. While a lot of aspects of the PETM are still being debated, the current knowledge can already be used as a proxy for present and future generations, showing how drastic the repercussions of rapid global warming can be, and how long it might take to get back down to baseline if we don't intervene and help. We have reached the end of the video. We hope you enjoyed and learned more about how Earth changed during the ages. This information may help you to better understand how we could tackle the issue of global warming that we are facing today. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below the video. We'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> have a swag day. Yeah. <laughs> Subscribe. Whoop.